This week on the Eldritch Lawcast, we unfurl Aurora, Age of Desolation, and Sean is finally able to talk about his new campaign setting, which is being kickstarted by Ghostfire Gaming right now. All that and more. Na na na, na 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 na. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one D and D podcast in my house right now because I am back home recording. I don't think I've been here since like early days of the Eldritch Lawcast, but I'm going to stop going on about my home. My name is Ben Byrne, and I am here as always with uh, Sean Merwin, James Haig, Dale Kingsmill. Dale, I have to ask if you had an environment. An extreme environment that would be your favorite to explore, either in a role playing game or possibly the real world, if you've ever traveled. Where would it be? <laughs> extreme snow? Do you want to travel into a volcano? Do you? Where do you want to go? I feel like this is going to very quickly uh, be pointed out as a flawed answer, but I I love me a little swamp. I okay. love I love a little swamp in in terms of tabletop RPGs. I'm a big fan of starting the party out in a sleepy swamp town. But that's that's my jam. Big fan of it. Um, I don't know. There's something about the colors of the whole thing and the soundscape of the whole thing that I just find very pleasant. Do you find no. the way you're describing swamp sounds like oddly calming? Yeah. Yes. And then you get further out from the sleepy swamp town and suddenly there's crocodiles and snakes and, you know, uh, mosquitoes as big as your head. And that part is where the thrill comes from. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. I'm, ima- I'm imagining like a Louisiana style swamp. I've never been to oh, Louisiana. Yeah. The, oh, the opening, yeah, the opening room of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland is my favorite place in the world. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Fair enough. Dale, I'm, I'm far too polite to like call your answer a flawed one. Like you seem to insinuate that we would. Could you explain to us why that's a flawed answer? <laughs> I'm going to point you right back to the mosquitoes as big as your head. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that speaks for itself. <laughs> mm, mm, good. Mm. James, what about you? Where do you love to explore? Oh, the mountains easily. Um, I I was just on a hiking road trip uh, a little bit ago to the Dalles Mountains in sort of the border between Washington and Oregon and also the border between uh, East and West Washington. And the road to get there takes you through the most incredible uh, sort of borderlands, uh, that I can, I can describe because all, all of sort of Eastern Washington was carved out by glacial movement, uh, receding from the ice age right next to an enormous mountain range, the Cascades. Um, and so it creates these scab lands and deep sort of fjords gouged out by ancient glaciers. And so you have these incredible formations of uh, volcanic rock that just kind of go in these diagonal striations all along the geography. And it is so striking to be there. And I can, you know, you can just imagine all of the griffins and things that have carved out little nests within the holes against those gigantic basalt formations uh, and all of the dragons that are kind of lurking on top of those peaks. So, yes, mountains, scablands, badlands, all of that. I love that. Part of me half wins that uh, half wishes that you'd been uh, hiking in the Catskills just because at the same time as you were describing the mountainous terrain we watched as Sean callously swiped away his cat did anyone see that <laughs> <laughs> didn't blink <laughs> and, and I was born in the Catskills hey it's all connected so, uh, it all comes around I, uh, mm-hmm. I know exactly what you're talking about, James, because w- I went on a holiday a few years ago with uh, my partner into the Otways, which is sort of nice forest, kind of rainforests and things in the south of Victoria, southwest of Victoria. Um, and as we're driving through these mountains, the place where we stayed was like a little, it was an Airbnb, a little lodge, like on top of a hill, really remote. We were like, oh, you know, if a zombie apocalypse happened while we were up here, we'd never know. And then COVID happened, um, but uh, like immediately <laughs> after. But uh, uh, while we were driving through these like mountains with gorges down beneath us and and trees kind of swept away on top of the mountain, um, I was making her laugh by continuously humming the Fellowship theme from Lord of the Rings um, and just narrating like made up verses from Lord of the Rings to myself as we traveled through the old mountain ways. Uh, Sean, what about you? Uh, an extreme or beautiful, otherwise beautiful environment that you like to explore? 
the environment this this doesn't quite answer the question but the place where i love to set encounters is in the air not on a mountaintop but literally falling because it's such it's such a uh, visceral thing to watch skydivers and to see movies where james bond without his parachute is falling and you know and characters have at, at even lower levels, feather fall or fly or abilities mm, that can mm. do things. But if you write an encounter and you give the characters, even that don't have magic, something that they can manipulate to in order to fly and put flying monsters in and you take falling into account, I love the dynamics of an encounter like that. Yeah, I, I love it as well. We, we did one a couple of years ago where – the party were trapped inside a dungeon. They were besieged inside the dungeon and their only way to escape was to jump out of a room that overlooked a cliff. So they jumped out, cast Featherfall, but there were these flying bat-like creatures that uh, flew down to harass them. And every turn we had to figure out, all right, so you drop, I think it's 60 feet, Featherfall says you you fall every round or something like that. And it's like, and they've got a flying speed of this. So as the party are falling, they keep like, uh, swooping down and, and we had rules that you could grab onto the cliff to stop yourself from falling, but you had to like not be able to use two hands uh, if you did that at that point. So very dynamic encounters. Uh, we're talking about environments because uh, big Ghostfire Gaming news this week, the biggest of Ghostfire Gaming news perhaps, uh, is that the Aurora Age of Desolation Kickstarter is now live. If you are listening to this in the latter half of May, early half of June 2022, click the link in the description. You can go check out the Kickstarter. Um, Sean, this is a setting that has been in your mind for several, uh, for years now, to my understanding, to hear you describe it. And we've been very, last week we sort of touched on it. We've been very hush, hush, oh, Aurora, we can't talk too much about it yet. But now the Kickstarter is live. All the secrets are spilled. Spill secrets, Sean. Spill secrets. What is your favorite thing? Uh, or what are you most excited spill. about? Spill! Uh, <laughs> you know, th- like, like you said, uh, Ben, this is a setting that I've been envisioning for years. It comes to me both as a physical place in which to set a game and a narrative structure that will allow you to tell some stories that you might not be able to tell in settings that you might be used to in D&D. So Aurora is a post-apocalyptic setting. Didn't start that way. It started as a typical fantasy world with all the happy elves and dwarves and orcs and troglodytes and anything you can imagine. And what they lacked were dragons. Uh, They've never met a dragon. And on this other world, uh, Terra Draca, the dragons were undergoing an assault by a species of sentient crystals that would swoop in and just devour whole worlds. The dragons could not defeat this entity, this crystalline hive mind entity. So they used the little magic that they had left to escape. A few of them were able to escape to a new world. And the new world that they found, thanks to their dragon goddess, was Aurora. So they escaped and now they are mingling with these people that had never met a dragon before and the dragons had never seen anything like this before because only dragons and dragon kin lived on uh terra draca instantly there is whatever you might imagine happening when dragons and and these sentient humanoids meet Uh, some worship the dragons as gods because they were so powerful and they were intelligent and could use magic and others thought they were demons from some other realm and wanted to kill them all. There was conflicts, there was resolutions, there was ev- everything, but time passes and life goes on until the ent- the entity called Shardscale uh, found the dragons again and started to invade Aurora. Same thing that happened on every world where the dragon, uh, the Shardscale uh, infestation happened. Everything started to be turned to crystal. And the only way that they could be protected was the goddess of the dragons, Jadol, decided to sacrifice herself and all of the creatures of the world to push out the shard scale. And she did. Every living creature, however, perished. But when uh, she did this, the, uh, the dragon goddess 
was able to absorb the energy from these creatures and turn it back into dragons, which were then told to go forth and to repopulate the world with themselves. But they were all also carrying traits from all these other humanoids that had sacrificed themselves uh, in what was called the Great Abjuration. So dragons started laying eggs, and some of these eggs bore true dragons, some bore dragon kin, but most were totally unique creatures that combined the traits of all of the humanoids that had sacrificed themselves in the Great Ab Abjuration. We'll, we'll, we'll pause there for a second. <laughs> That's the backstory of, of Aurora, but what that allows us to do in terms of game design mechanics is allows players to create characters of no particular race, but combining all the characteristics, the traits of all the different races that we're used to into unique entities. Mm. So that was our game design challenge then. I'm going to pause there and take a drink. <laughs> I love the uh, the new character creation system. There are 80 or over 80 or about 80 uh, like aspects mm -hmm. or um, character traits, racial traits that you can choose mm -hmm. from. And you have seven slots, I believe it is. And you just slot those in, in any combination that you kind of want to have to create your entirely unique character. Dale, I can see you chomping at the bit. Well, I remember two weeks ago when I was like, oh, wouldn't that be a great thing to see in character creation? And you <laughs> just sat there. You just sat there going, ooh, I, ooh, <laughs> I see how it is. That would be a good yes. idea. <laughs> I mean, I'm so curious about this system uh, because you have these seven slots for racial traits uh, to to use an existing phrase uh, are how do you keep them sort of balanced with one another, right? How can you have flight, for example, versus say, you know, resistance to poison or something like that? Are they all kind of equally weighted or is there kind of something else going on? There is definitely something else going on. What we have done, and when I say we, I'm mostly referring to Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who is the architect of this system. Uh, if you don't know Scott Fitzgerald Gray's name, you should, uh, listeners out there. He has edited a good uh, chunk of all of the Wizards of the Coast products for the last 15 years, give or take, uh, and, as well as being a great designer, a uh, great developer, uh, incredible D and D mind. So we were tasked with exactly that. How do we make them all even? The first step is putting them into categories. Well, what categories could we come up with? D and D gave us categories: combat, exploration, and role playing. So we'd first divide all of the traits into those three categories, and then we say you can take three from column A, two from column B, two from column C. So right there, we are narrowing down that selection process to give the best uh, overlay of the different types of games you can have. Now, that was something we decided just based on looking at all the different races that are already in D&D. But as the game master, you are particularly in your uh, realm to say, you know what, I run a very combat heavy game and I want to be very challenging. Take four from combat one from exploration and two or three from role playing. If you're playing ro a role playing heavy game, you can say take only two combat, but take three role playing and you can adjust it. As long as all the players at your table are in the same realm of power, you can make a very high powered character. You can make a very uh, low powered character in terms of combat, but buff up the other aspects of the character in those three categories. Oh, I, I I just want to get my hands on this system now. I, I just want to no. I want to monkey with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm mentally well, comparing it to stuff I've <laughs> been working on in the background, but I'm like, this is already done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> I, I'm sure that it can always use tweaking. We could always add traits. You can always you know look at it in in different ways. So isn't that just such a gift to homebrewers the world over, though? Right? Like you had. You hand homebrewers like a category such as subclass and they have a field day with it. You hand them, you know, and this is just handing them another thing. Hey, you know how you like making up feats? 
go ahead and make up some racial traits, you know, mm, right? That's, right. That's, that's great. That's Christmas. Well, another thing that we've added is the ability to take a trait more than once to get a more powerful version of that particular trait. So uh, if like if if increased speed ooh, is like is it. a trait that you want, you can take it twice or maybe even three times, and you can tweak with that. Uh, if you take natural weapon as one of your you know, uh, traits, your character traits, then you can have with one point you can have one natural weapon. With two points, you could take two natural weapons. You can make yourself into a mini dinosaur with teeth and claws <laughs> and a big bludgeoning tail, right? And and what this does. More than mechanically, what it does narratively is remove race as a, an aspect of this world. And if you think of how race sometimes may limit a setting, all the dwarves think exactly alike. All the dwarves mm -hmm. are going to group together. When you add that to a world, or when you remove that from a world, you're adding story now where the narrative has to take into account how do people come together? Why do they come together? How does the story change when you have to make new connections? What impetus does that give? What agency, that's the word I'm looking for, does that give to the players to come up with new ways to, to group their, their, uh, their party and, and do something uh, interesting with that? Mm. This is exactly the sort of thing I was thinking of when we were talking about the aliens in Mos Eisley a couple of weeks ago. Literally, this... <laughs> Right? The buffet, the buffet. Right? A bunch of yeah. weird creatures who are more about who they are as people and the and the cool, uh, unique things they've got going on, rather than do these fit into a fantasy archetype sort of thing. Sure. Yes, yes. I mean, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, I love what I love about it is the fact that the the traits are also. Um, Descriptive, not prescriptive, or or at least they're not prescriptive in the way of like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but my understanding is if you choose flight, for example, as a uh, trait, it might mean that your character has wings, or it might mean that they can magically project themselves into the air, or it might mean that they've got some form of limited tel telepathy to be able to lift themselves into the air, or whatever it is. If you can climb walls, um, it might be Benjamin, you have that's little claws. called telekinesis. Oh, all right, all right, Not Dale. We just yeah, got schooled, just... taken to school. <laughs> Sorry, I fell for the, the the Professor X fallacy when people say that <laughs> Professor X is telekinetic. Um, uh, you know, so the, the idea is that you can imagine your character how you want them to be. They're not described as having specific physical traits. It's just that they have abilities that you can describe how you want. And the other thing, which I think you already described nicely, Sean, is that, um, you know, you don't get locked into playing a certain type of character, uh, because you want certain bonuses or whatever, you know, you can't make a really optimized or half orc uh, wizard, you know, because they don't get the appropriate mm. bonuses to be able to make that. Doesn't mean you can't make one, but I love this system for being able to uh, allow players to feel like they're not locked into certain uh, mechanical or even thematic um, restrictions that are typically placed upon the game. It's one of those neat systems where there's so much room for both people who want to like play mechanically like i mm. want to make an optimized build and for people who want to play role play heavy and be like well my character grew up in the tunnels beneath the blah 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 you know and so there's just this nice sort of um i don't know i don't know open field for everyone to run into that that's exactly what it is it reminds me of um transistor was a video game i think by Oh, I can't remember the name of the it's studio off the top of my head. It's I was super gonna giant. say that, but I thought Hades. I was gonna be wrong. Yeah, yeah. And what I loved about Transistor was that you got like an ability, and I'm gonna get these wrong, but just to give an example, it's like you have an ability to throw a grenade and you have an ability to like zip really fast. If you stack zipping fast onto the grenade, then your gr you throw your grenade and it zips across the room and then explodes. But if you stack uh, the grenade onto zipping fast, you zip fast across the room and drop a bunch of grenades behind you. So it's kind of like stacks in different ways to create different combinations so that you can find your play style. And that's what this system kind of reminds me of is like you can really find what um, attracts you to a certain type of character and, and engineer that into being. If you're a game master and you're worried that, you know, normal races in D&D are a fast way to get pl players to make their character because they just get a set, 
what we do in the book is just say, if you want to play a typical elf type character, just choose these seven. If you want to play a dwarfy mm-hmm. character, just choose these seven. So you've still got that. Uh, if you're worried about it being too many choices for a player, they can go to those mm-hmm. packages and just, just pick them. But of course, right. the character creation not being the only uh, new toy uh, that is coming in Aurora. Um, you know, there's there's classes, there's um, backgrounds that are specific to the setting. Um, but the reason I asked mm-hmm. my weirdly specific question at the start is because survival and exploration uh, have really been brought into the foreground. Um, Sean, do you want to talk a little bit about the realms themselves and, and what each of them sort of represent, the five realms of Aurora? Each of the five realms is associated with one of the chromatic dragons. This was done to enhance what the a realm could be. If you think of dragons in a regular 5e game, they have regional effects and layer actions and so on. What we decided to do with each of these realms is make it regional effects but turn it up to 11 and have it cover the entire realm. So the realm has taken on the characteristics of each of these dragons. So the first uh, realm is Magsturma, which is the dr- realm of the red dragon. And it uh, it is full of lava and volcanoes and constant uh, rippling earthquakes and very violent, a very violent place. Another realm is Galat, which is a sand-covered wasteland. Uh Prazalor is the realm of ice and tundra, and of course a white dragon oversees that. We have Kor, which is the swamp realm overseen by the black dragon. So Dale, you could be happy with that. And Tyvmer <laughs> is the forest, the twisted forest realm of the green dragon uh, overlord. Now, what is important about each of these realms is that the dragons ruled over them. Uh, after the Great Abjuration, and sort of became the the overseers of all the creatures that live there. So each realm had its own sort of personality, its own political system, with the true dragons overseeing the dragon kin, who then oversaw all of the other creatures that were born after the Great Abjuration. Now what happens is... Uh, some of this shard scale slips through the cracks of the Great Abjuration. And the first thing that happens is the dragons begin to lose their minds. And it is called the Dragon Rage. And this is where everything starts to go sideways. Not only do the dragons begin to turn feral, uh, most of them start to turn feral, but the social structures that have been put into place in all of these realms collapses. So... What the characters have to overcome is not just this sort of dragon threat, but the the threat of what do we do with this society that we had lived in for years and years and years, which is now collapsed, and how do we get food? We've always Mm -hmm. just had dragons help us, or we've always just gone to this place and the dragon can have shown us how to farm. Now what do we do? At the same time, magic had been held at bay. So the magic was muted, and now with the cracking of the Great Abjuration, magic comes flooding back into the realms as well. So uh, creatures who had once maybe had some latent talents but never been able to fully express them are now flooded with abilities. And so all of this is happening all at once. And you can set the campaign that you create at any point during this time. You could set it right directly As the Dragon Rage begins, you could set it 500 years later as the effects of the Dragon Rage and the further intrusion of the Shard Scale has crumbled society even more. Wherever you think your best story is going to be, that's where you can set it. Mm. Underneath each of these realms is also some secrets. So it's not just a red dragon overseeing a volcano realm. There are other things at play. Uh, I don't want to co- go too deeply into them because there are some really fun secrets that might be uh, that I might be spoiling way t- way too early. Uh, development yeah. is still ongoing as well, so we're adding things and tweaking things. But 
you know, people have been asking, what if there was a shadow fell sort of place that was seeping in? And the answer is, oh, there is. <laughs> and that's already taken into account in one or more of the realms. So there's, there's secrets. There's other things happening in each of these realms uh, as well. On the surface, it's the dragons and, and the, the rough uh, environment that is cropping up in each. But there's a lot more story underlying each of these realms. Um, if you haven't checked out the Kickstarter yet, um, do so. There's also plenty of, um, you know, game raids, things in there that, um, uh, you know, will help uh, bring Aurora to life. I'm a big fan in particular of the fact we've got these 80 new character creation options. Um, one of the tiers features like a character notebook, which basically allows you to um, easily assemble your character inside of there, as well as um, character uh, cards so kind of like the spell cards that uh, wizards do for 5e and i think that sort of stuff is just so convenient and so easy so you're not like oh how much damage does this do what does this ability do specifically i love having all of that stuff easily accessible plus as we talked about last week um there is the mother of all dragons um uh, there is i'm just bringing the name up tora shiva am i pronouncing that correctly sean uh yeah, Tor- tora uh, as a 12 inch tall, 15 inch wide, uh, gigantic dragon miniature that I'm pretty sure puts these dudes behind me to shame. Um, it is huge. So if that is your jam, there's actually a pledge to get the PDF and the dragon if just the miniature, uh, is what you're after. So that thing is going to be massive. In fact, it's so big. Sorry. I can't, I, I've got to gush about this thing for a second. It's so big. It's on a giant that it has killed. So, like, a giant is dead on the base, and that's part of how huge okay. this miniature is. Um, mm-hmm. Here, Biggin. I, I'm not way. prone as a D&D player to, you know, running away. <laughs> 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 but I think if the DM put that on the table, yeah, I'd run away. <laughs> Time to go. Time it's to- just, you know what? Yeah. I think I'm going to retire. We, 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 I can see you're busy. Uh, I will come back at uh, another Thank time. Thank you for your time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, Sean, any any last bits that I've missed out that you really want to mention uh, about Aurora? Yeah, three things very, very quickly. There is a new advantage system. What this does is if you have advantage on a, on a roll, on a check, you can forego the advantage, forego the second die, and instead draw a card from the advantage deck. What this card does is gives you a certain power that you can then use later. It and it, so it's random, so there's a little bit of chance here. But something like one of the cards might say, on on a, a check that you are about to make, you can automatically succeed by playing this card. However. The next uh, check that you make after this has disadvantage uh, because you've put so much energy into this saving throw or attack roll or or ability check that you're that you're a little bit shaky. So there are things like that that you can also uh, trade with other players or, or do things like that. And it's just a way to take a system that's fine, right? Advantage is a fine system, but add a little mm-hmm. gamification to it to. To give yourself a little advantage, maybe a little advantage down the line. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a exploration mechanic that does more than just hide pieces of the map from you and then then show you. Uh, it part of the thing that your character will likely have to do is go out and look for resources. So this exploration mechanic uh, gamifies this exploration in a way that's very interesting. Uh, each realm has a character sheet and the players are given a blank character sheet. And so as they explore, they learn pieces of what makes the realm what it is. And they can learn secrets and they can learn new locations and they can find areas with new resources. And they are filling that sheet in as they play. So, and then there are game mechanics that surround that as well. Uh, the final thing is a survival mechanic. Uh, Phil Beckwith, who is the project manager, says this so well, I'm going to paraphrase him. It's In, in a lot of D&D, ex- the exploration is sort of not exactly invigorating. 
and it tends to downplay character uh, powers and traits rather than uplift them. So we try to, in a similar way that with the exploration, you know, we try to gamify survival a bit more, make it more interesting, make it uh, something that is a story in and of itself or melds very well with the other stories that you might tell, making survival an important aspect of play, especially at lower levels. I can't believe I forgot to mention the advantage system, actually. I mean, the exploration uh, (laughs) stuff is really fantastic because I think it can be ported into other games as well if you just want to bring a more Mm -hmm. robust um, exploration system into a campaign that you're running that happens to be in an icy tundra or a volcanic place or a a deep swamp in uh, Dale's campaign. Um, The advantage system reminds me of... It reminds me of uh, Momentum, which I think I mentioned from the Infinity role-playing game, which my copy of is actually right Mm -hmm. there. Uh, It's weird doing this from home again. Um, uh, And uh, also when we played uh, Fate, you know, Fate has, is it gain an advantage? And it's sort of, it's more than just rolling a dice and, uh, you know, having a, a, a numerically higher chance of achieving something, but it, it adds narrative to the story. Um, the the card, correct me if I'm wrong, that you mentioned where you get a check to automatically succeed, but then you have disadvantage on the next one um, was called don't get cocky or something along those lines. Right. And so while it's just a narrative suggestion, I do love the idea of this Han Solo-esque, you know, rogue who one shots a, a villain or a, a, a pack leader in an enemy group, he, you know, automatically hit. Uh, I had advantage on the roll, so I'm going to uh, do my sneak attack damage. Ha ha! And now on the next attack, just completely whiff it or some dexterity save or something like that. Um, so I love that it adds narrative layers, not just mechanical benefits. Subclasses and 15 subclasses, 15 backgrounds, new monsters, templates to add uh, the, the shard scale uh, affliction to monsters. Uh, it, you know, the list goes on and on and on, but I know that we want to discuss other things today, so I will leave it at that. <laughs> no, but honestly, check out I mean, the Kickstarter. More Aurora. More Aurora. <laughs> yeah. more Aurora. We can discuss Aurora all day. More Aurora, I was saying, more Aurora, uh, I was saying, <laughs> I had that meme in my head all week when we were being like, being, uh, like uh, you know, really hush hush quiet about it, and all the the Ghost Fire fans kind of being like, "What May is I going on it? in there?" <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> exactly. Exactly that. Um, I love the the shard scale mechanics. Just briefly, I was saying earlier today when we did the the Q and A stream um, that the you know it gives small benefits, but it is an affliction um, that the characters uh, have to deal with. That it can be uh, if the GM wishes to be uh, something that is inflicted on the players as well. And it just it reminded me of something you've said in the past, Dale, which is like tempt your players. You know, give them give them uh, 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 reasons not to to get rid of bad Suck effects immediately. Yeah, Hook exactly. Um, so yeah heaps to love in it uh like i said a link to the kickstarter is in the show notes uh so even if you're on spotify or you're on itunes or where whatever podcast app you're using you should be able to find a link to the kickstarter if you want to check it out um uh, and if you're listening to this two years later aurora will almost undoubtedly uh be available through the ghostfire gaming store get on it speaking of online stores, uh, small bit of general news this week, uh, which was that D and D Beyond are pulling Volo's Guide to Monsters and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. They will no longer be for sale on the D and D Beyond store uh, because, ostensibly, Monsters of the Multiverse uh, are going to be replacing it. Um, and I just, I found this, you know, it's, it's a small tidbit of news, but the implications to me are fascinating, especially because, um, you know, I, I was deep in the uh, knowledge of the, the video game industry and battling with things like preservation. Um, if, if people are familiar, the video game PT was like this horror game that was available through the Sony store for free because it was a trailer for Silent Hills, was it? A Silent Hill game that was being done um, by Guillermo del Toro um, and Joey, help me out here. Hideo Kojima. Hideo Kojima, thank you. Um, And the game got cancelled and the trailer got pulled. The game got pulled. You could no longer download it. And I think they even went as far as deleting it off your PS4 as if your PS4 was networked. 
So to be able to preserve a copy of the game, you had to have an unnetworked PS4. I might be wrong about that last bit, but that's what this no, reminds me that of. That sounds pretty legit. That sounds about right. Yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> and, and that's what this reminds me of. Like, yes, a lot of these stat blocks will still be there. Um, your your Morden Kynans and your Volos uh, monsters aren't going away if you've already purchased them. That's worth quickly clarifying, uh, given what I just said. So if you've already purchased them, you, already, you will still have all that stuff. But... Uh, the monsters of the multiverse is is um, replacing it. What? Do, how do we feel about this? Does this does this make anybody else feel kind of slightly odd or don't care or you know it's the way the digital world moves forward? I think it's it's a stark reminder to people who do care uh, about the significance of hard copy print media. Um, it this honestly doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't mind that it's changing, that a game is kind of a living document that is getting updated, but I do relate to the preservationist stance. And also my opinion is very colored by the fact that I own books uh, for both of those. I own them in normal edition and special edition because I'm a, I'm an obsessive collector. Uh, so I don't know if I didn't have those books, would I feel very strongly? I, I feel like if I were an average fan who wasn't dedicated to print media or collection or preservation or anything like that, I'd be just like, oh, the monsters are getting updated. Oh, I can't buy the old outdated version anymore. Oh, well. Um, but I don't know. Is there is there an aspect of this that I'm that I'm not totally tuned into? I don't know. As a as the resident person who buys DVDs uh, and continues to think that that's a good idea, I I do feel like there's. It's strange because this one doesn't like get me. I'm not like oh how dare they or anything like that. But um, but it does it does make my weird senses tingle. You know, I'm like that's hmm. when you have the power to archive it. It seems a little bit like. Well, what's the point? I can understand from a from a sales point of view, you don't want to confuse people by having two contradictory, yeah, like it's an updated well. version of the product. I do think that there's room there for for also maintaining the archive of like, look at the process. Because it's so fascinating with a game like D&D to see how things change over time, even within one edition, right? So I think it's a shame to lose access to that stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of a... a big pro access person and i think that there is actually more room for it than with like the video game example we just had because you could just have up for sale the new books on dnd beyond and when someone buys them they also happen to get access to the old version so that they can see them compare see what changed why it changed i think that that uh would be interesting but i i don't think it's like immoral <laughs> to to remove the access yeah, I don't know. Like immoral is a uh, is a. Uh, we've we've talked about the wibbly wobbliness of morality before. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's, like that, it's a slippery slope. It, it's a specific way of putting it, I suppose. And like, I wouldn't be like, oh, it's immoral. They're you know they're a big big business. Blah blah blah. Nothing like that. But there's just different things that jump into my mind. Like uh, there's no mention of whether they'll continue to publish the print uh, versions of Morden Kynans and Volos. And what's interesting about that, James, do you have something to say to that? Oh, it just seems unlikely. <laughs> I, I would be surprised if they continue to sell the print editions. Um, or, I mean, they'll continue to sell them, but I doubt they'll print new, right. uh, you know, a new print run. I doubt they'll ever order a new print run. But what's interesting um, about that, and I don't know anything, I don't know much about Monsters of the Multiverse, and so maybe there's an answer to this, but those books, particularly Mordenkainen's, is more than just the rules of the monsters, right? Like the rules of the monsters are like, you know, a small, oh, oh, Sean, he's just shown up a copy of Multiverse. I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about that, but I do have questions. Maybe maybe you can answer <laughs> this question, which is like, you know, there's a lore about the blood war and in Volo's guide, there's like guides to hags and giants and, and kobolds, I think. Um, is all that stuff going away? You know, will people still be able to find and access the law that is provided within um, those earlier books, or is that all just going to be gone away? Is that even accessible through D&D &D Beyond? I don't know um, because I'm not sure whether D&D &D Beyond is actually just a rules space. It's it's both. And it for me, it goes back to the before times when we didn't have digital books and we all wished 
<gasps> oh, wouldn't it be great if we had digital versions of this that wizards could update so we didn't have to download errata and yeah. glue it into our books? Now, now they're doing that. And and people are upset about it. And I understand why people are upset about it, because you don't want to buy something and then have it taken away from you, no matter what, no yeah. matter how horrible it is. Yeah, right. But it also gives wizards the control, the ability to control the narrative of their own products. So if what they printed about the blood war turns out to have been problematic for some reason, they sure. can just say this is problematic, and while it is your right to buy the book and keep the book, we are controlling this portion of it. And if you're a collector, then you're going to be upset, and that's perfectly fine. If you're an average DM and player who just want the most up-to-date version of the monster to put into your game, then it's convenient for you. So mm. you don't have to worry about the old stuff. You can just get the, the new content. I think it's I think it's good that he used the word problematic in this context because it actually encompasses a very wide range of things that wizards could be trying to control for. We can use problematic in the sort of modern internet usage where it's like, oh, this has, you know, racist or homophobic undertones that we don't want to promote in our product. Let's change it because it's problematic in that way. But uh it it could also be problematic in terms of, for example, their story strategy. Right? You know, Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out. And maybe for one reason or another, there's contradictory information being uh, put forth in one part of the game and being put forth in one part of the game. And maybe they want to tie things in to match with the movie that they're making. And for better or for worse, they have the ability to uh, address these problematic rough edges in their sort of continuity uh, kind of all at once. And I think for the most part, it's going to be the game books that need to be sort of uh, malleable in this way because uh, they're a lot easier to mold than mm. the Hollywood blockbuster or the AAA video game or something mm. like that. Mm. And I like, Sean, that you use the word control because I think that actually gets down to um, kind of an interesting element of this. I suspect that... Um, a lot of people who are troubled by this choice, that it comes down to a, a game of control, right? Because this is, this is in, a, in a weird way, more than most media, um, a product that is handing control to the person who buys it, right? Because you are, if you buy this book, you can run the game and you are the DM and you have control over that game. Um, and so you have all these people who want to have control over, over what their players can use what you know how how the game looks for them and this feels like a little piece of that control being taken away right mm. it's 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 like how i feel when netflix takes down my favorite tv show that's mm. why i need the dvds because i want control over the product <laughs> i paid for right it's, but but it is it is a little bit of wizards of the coast reasserting control over what is D, &D. um and you know that's it's it's fine, but I think a lot of people, probably myself included, on some on some level, feel that little sense of like, wait, hmm? but is it a sign of things to come? Will well, that, I lose that, my control? Yeah, well, that's exactly it. I mean, it brings into questions that have been talked about in the video game industry for the last five, ten years now, which is like the nature of ownership. You know? Yeah, if you whether... buy a game through Steam, do you own it or are you just paying yeah. for the right to use it? Exactly. Is this a step towards D and D as a service? In the way that a lot of games, you don't actually own it; you just kind of subscribe to the game, uh, and by, by continuing to subscribe, you have access to all of the books that you haven't had to buy on D and D Beyond. But mm -hmm. if you ever stop subscribing, well, then say goodbye to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while I suspect there's a large overlap between folks that are into video games and folks that are into, uh, you know, tabletop role-playing games, that Venn diagram definitely isn't a circle, you know? And so I wonder if there's folks who aren't used to this sort of control by a company being asserted who are going to be, uh, you know, find this really weird. Like, wait, yeah. what? I don't, I, I can't well, buy that book anymore. Yeah, and it is so different to other mediums, right? Like, just because a new Spider-Man movie comes out doesn't mean that you've lost access to the previous versions of Spider-Man. Um, it, it is a bizarre 
quite different thing. Like, even, even in video games, we don't tend to see that kind of a step of like, well, this is updated, so you no longer can have the other one. Um, I'm not so yeah. sure I agree yeah. with that. <gasps> I agree uh, with James. Because, because a lot of the monsters in Volo's Guide are being reprinted in Monsters of the Multiverse. And I mean, I, mean, I think that's the, that's the point of it all. It's to take all of the monster stat blocks from uh, the ancillary sources and then kind of republish them in a new source. That's, I, I can't imagine that being any different than, say, you know, if I'm playing World of Warcraft and Blizzard decides to rebalance some encounter, then all of a sudden I've, you know, I've permanently lost access to the old version of the game. But, you know, maybe because it wasn't published in a hardcover book and sold to me as a discrete bit of game, that doesn't that doesn't hit me as hard. When it's on a video game, it's like, oh, this is how the game has evolved. And this is just the nature of the game. That's I'm true. I, part of this game. is is probably that I uh, play much less uh, online gaming than other people, which I mean, let's not even get into the whole thing of that but that that's true i'm coming at this from my own perspective of like oh this is what video games are but if i'm not playing a game that is reliant on everyone who plays online having the exact same version of everything like of course i wouldn't consider that so that's a really good point yeah it mildly reminds me of uh, overwatch i used to play overwatch mm. uh, for the first two years of its release incessantly and they've changed the game so much now in the structure of how it works where you get role locked so you can't sort of flip between roles between uh you know if 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 i'm healing and you're tanking and and, and it's just not working and i need to swap to a tank and you need to swap to a healer that's no longer doable within that game and so there is de like i i frequently say to people i miss playing overwatch and i can't play it anymore not because i can't get the disc and go and play it but i can't play that version of the game that i really enjoyed I'll be honest, I think this is a bit of a false equivalency, but I think that it, it raises similar questions. Yeah, it's it's important we don't say that, you know, the game hasn't been permanently altered. The game may skew differently now that this is the only version of it being sold. But for the most part, you know, if you want the old content, it's still there. This is just kind of an, an outgrowth of yeah, the way that we have not gone there. to Edition it's, Wars. It's still there. It's still there, there if you own it already. You it's still there if you own it already yeah. or you pirate it illegally or if you, you know, manage you to find copy. it in the internet's back alleys. Like, <laughs> yes, sure. yes, but, but, it, but it hasn't been thrown out. And PDFs and Volo's Guide will exist forever. They're going to be like cockroaches on the internet. They're, I mean, they're out there. They've been pirated hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not to compare Volo's Guide to a cockroach. I like it. But, I mean, but here's the thing: no one, no one should be forced to break the law in order to to be able to say that something is still accessible, right? If it, if it's a, if it's technically illegal to get to it, then it's not really technically accessible. Well, how how far do we extend this accessibility uh, discussion into an older version of a game? I think it's really good that, say, for instance, PDFs of most. Is it most of, of a great deal of older edition of D&D stuff is available on Drive Through RPG or the DMs Guild? I think that's a great way to sort of preserve older editions. Yeah, maybe they should do that. Play it. Maybe they should. Yeah, uh, Actually, I think that would be a great I suppose, idea. I, suppose, I, I think it would be great to st stamp a sort of legacy content thing yes. on, the, on the front of Volo's Guide's head and say, here, here it is. We aren't using this anymore, but it's off, here on the DMs. Yeah, I think that would be field great. Off the with Because, and, I, again, like, <laughs> I think... James's dad. <laughs> like... <laughs> I think, I think often what you find is that there is an audience for these kinds of products who will still happily pay for that product, right? Mm -hmm. So I think completely taking it away is, particularly in light of this conversation, it does make me wonder what it means in terms of um, moving more towards that sort of Adventurers League style, um, everyone playing on the same plane more than as we currently exist where it's really table by table yeah. You know, everything's completely different no matter where you go. Since you brought Adventures League into this into this conversation, I think I can honestly say that Wizards of the Coast would not want that. They want DMs to create their own content. They don't want to be the the dungeon master overall. They just want to help have better control over how they are perceived based on the content that they're putting out. Uh, and that's why that 
ability to make changes, to make adjustments. And they don't also don't want to tick off their consum- customer base. Uh, mm. Although they, you know, will take the steps to do so. And they consistently If it balances do, yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, well, but- any company will tick off their customers no matter what, because that's the nature of companies and customers. But that's yeah. a whole different conversation. Yeah, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I feel like it's it's a fairly innocuous decision that probably does not mark any kind of insidious intent or even any mm. like major intent. It's just a thing that they decided to do that shouldn't really matter one way or another. But it does have interesting implications that maybe haven't been mm. like rigorously considered. I, I think it's safe to say that they probably haven't even considered the implications of all of the digital things. I mean, they ju- D&D Beyond, as of this recording, it's still a couple of days before D&D Beyond becomes officially part of Wizards of the Coast. And so they're probably still grappling with all of the questions of digital content and what it means and, and thousands of questions that they haven't even conceived asking yet. I think the most level-headed response to we've lost content is... There is a lot of lore in Volo's Guide and Warning Canons that's just not there anymore. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure there are some gross people out there who are like, I like my extremely, you know, evil race as default, yeah. uh, sort of uh, hobgoblins or whatever, however it was presented in, mm-hmm. in Volo's Guide. And I'm like, well, that's not the opinion I want to listen to. But I think there's a reasonable uh, worry out there. <laughs> All of a sudden, a lot of really good expansive lore was lost and there's kind of a vacuum now. There's nothing to fill it. And I think what we're feeling right now, and this, maybe this is an optimistic take, I'm not sure, but we're feeling kind of a, a vacuum that will soon be filled. Whenever D&D gets that sort of refresh that we expect is going to come in 2024, I'll bet that a lot of the lore that we are feeling the loss of right now for things like goblins and mind flayers and beholders and so forth from Volo's Guide and Githyanki and Morden Canons and stuff like that will be filled uh, with whatever Wizards is trying to mold the lore into now. We've kind of seen that going on with Drow over the past year. Drow were kind of uh, uh, public enemy number one because there is a lot of sort of, uh, we do not like how this race has been presented for like all of D&D's history going on in Wizards of the Coast heads right now. How do we make that work for uh, the game that we're trying to make now, for the audience that we want now, for uh, you know the 21st century, stuff like that. Mm. Um, and I, I'll bet that's on the way. I'll bet it's on the way. I, I think you're right, and I, you know, the the these books are going away is instantly filled by monsters of the multiverse. I think the same day it becomes available is when these other books go down on D and D Beyond. I think I'm going to say something hysterical in a moment, but to balance that out, um, I think to to you know look at the positives. One thing that I really like about this change is that I have had on um, like the podcast run sheet since probably the second or third episode. And I don't think we ever got around to it, but a discussion about like, is 5e starting to hit the bloat that, you know, 3.5 was infamous for? And I think that you, I, when I go to games, I, people often joke when I was running games professionally, I'd rock up at their house and they'd joke about me moving in because I had a suitcase filled with books because it was too heavy to um, carry all of that in my in my backpack and a, a smart person is going to say, why didn't you just use D&D Beyond? And that's only occurring to me just now. But like, you know, the, <laughs> it would be like, all right, I take the player's handbook, the monster manual and the um, and the DMG and Volo's Guide to Monster in case anybody's playing an Asma. And uh, Tasha's Cauldron, you know, was the latest one. And, uh, you know, Morden Kynans in case I want to use this specific monster, this set, you know, and I got a bigger and bigger stack of books that that seemed essential for every session. And I think thinning that stack down through new releases and, and consolidating some of the stuff that came before is very smart. You know, Mo- Monsters of the Multiverse almost feels like Player's Handbook 2 in terms of um, consolidating all the the new player races that were across and the, and the subclasses and thing, or maybe not the subclasses because they're in other stuff, but you know what I'm saying, um, that were in Volos and, and um, uh, uh, Morden Kynans. But the hysterical thing I'm about to say, and this is like read into this as man shakes fist at cloud um, <laughs> sort of uh, hysteria, but 
I just want to raise it as a possibility because when they release 5.5, which they've teased, and potentially a sixth edition, do they remove the ability? And these are going to be compatible, 5.5 at least is going to be compatible with everything in fifth edition, as they've said, but will they start to remove things from fifth edition from D&D Beyond at the point that when sixth edition comes along, if and when, um, it's like, no, D&D Beyond is where you play sixth edition now. You can't access fifth edition rules through D&D Beyond anymore. And people talked when fourth came out, you know, your third edition rule books didn't burst into flames. You can still play third edition. What if digitally your rule books do burst into flames and kind of disappear into dust? Like I said, it's maybe incredibly unlikely to happen, but it's the door that these kind of digital ownership conversations um, definitely open. I mean, I actually think that the wild thing about it is that it's not like it is unlikely to happen. It's just that it'll happen a long time from now. Sure. You know, if it happens. I, I, I think that it's it's just that thing that, you know, we like to say that everything on the internet is there forever. And to some degree, yes. But uh, but again, it's yeah, it's this. It's that accessibility <laughs> thing. It's how, like, how yeah, sort of. Um, but in terms of the amount of work that you have to do to get to it after, you know, a decade has passed, it gets harder, um, you know. And there is this sentimental wish of mine to, to think about the Internet as this, like, perfect archive where we can keep all of the missteps and, and you know, look back through them. And the other day I found myself watching a video about, like, the history of the cursor and how terrible it used to be, you know, um, that kind of thing where it's like, look, we can look back at it and we can see what was good and what was bad and we can just, like, glory in in this uh in this passage of time but i mean yeah. anyone who's who's a fan fiction reader knows that it's like you go you go back to read that favorite fanfic and it is gone someone else has control over that and it is gone because the internet uh, as much as we like to think of it as permanent it is also ephemeral somehow yeah. at the same time um yeah can, can we talk about the really important news this week acquisitions incorporated is being given away for free on D and D Beyond, starting maybe when this show drops. Uh, As is that little adventure called The Lost Mine of Fandelver. That's you know not hey. important, but the Acquisitions Incorporated <laughs> book free if you sign up for D and D Beyond. It's good, and Sean should know he wrote the thing. Yeah, I was about to say it's a big week for Sean. <laughs> oh, it, I forgot that I had worked on that. Yes, thank you for reminding oh. me. <laughs> oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but no joke. It is really good. It is really good. Speaking of mechanics and changes, um, Cole Soak is that um, no? That's not a random word. That's their username on YouTube. Cole Soak. Um, left us a comment on YouTube in relation to the conversation I think we had last week about uh, giving things to your players, responsibilities to your players, um, uh, giving them, uh, you know, responsibility for tracking monster health or, um, you know, whatever it happens to be, uh, deciding when they get to level up. And Cole Soak's question was about um, giving initiative to player characters um, and doing, I think it's referred to as popcorn initiative, where the player whose turn it is gets to choose who the next uh, turn goes to, gets to choose who the next turn goes to, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, are we? Oh, wow. Sorry, Dante. I just realized when are we really at the one hour three mark? Ooh. I uh, I just started getting messages from Dante. I swear it said 40 minutes a second ago on my end. So if we are <laughs> over time, then we will wrap it up there. Uh, my apologies. Uh, yeah, my time. Save it out for of next whack. week. Save it. <laughs> yeah, I will put I will put Cole Soak's Although I was gonna say popcorn initiative is was originally from the Marvel Ultimate role playing game, which, by That's the true. way, you can no longer access online except by illegal means. I'm just saying. <laughs> Cool. There you go. There you go. Digital ownership. Bad. Um, all right. Let me wrap this up <laughs> instead. <laughs> That's it. That's the message. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I want no, to leave it. No nuance needed to no. that one. No way. <laughs> no. Nope. Black, white. <laughs> Speaking of things going away, uh, we are about to do so this week because it is the end of the Eldritch Lawcast. It's all we have time for this week. Uh, we didn't get around to any listener emails or comments, but if you want to send us an email, uh, hit up 
podcast at ghostfiregaming.com uh, or leave us a message, a comment in the YouTube comments if that's where you're listening to this. Uh, five star ratings are absolutely amazing. Helps us get out to more people. If you enjoy these conversations, hit us up on Twitter. Our uh, Twitter handles are just below our name uh, or tell your friends, take it to them and ask them what they think about digital ownership. Um, until next week, I've been Ben Byrne here with James Haig, Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin. Check out Aurora and we will see you soon.